Hey, so what if Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, and these other streaming services are actually destined to fail? Is that the case? Well, we're going to discuss that today, as well as answering another question we've gotten about which iPhone you should buy. I'm your host, Luke Clayton, and welcome to the Must Increase Podcast. Welcome to the Must Increase Podcast. This is your home of Church Media HQ and so much more. Our mission is to increase truth and inspire hope in the lives of others, uh, such as your church, your business, your family, and beyond. And as I mentioned, I am your host, Luke Clayton, and I want to thank you for being with me for this episode. Well, to start with stuff I like for this episode, I am going to highlight the Apple Watch SE. And uh, this is the latest SE. I believe there's been two versions of it now, and they just updated it here back in uh, their latest uh, iPhone and Apple Watch event. Uh, and uh, I had a series three. And honestly, I was pretty happy with it for the longest time. I've never been one to really just wig out over the watch. I think it's cool. It's got some cool features uh, and things like that. But as far as having the latest and greatest watch, it's never been a priority to me. Um, but the Series 3 was getting to the point where it was very sluggish. Uh, it only has eight gigs of internal storage, which is not a lot. And so I was getting all these warnings about how, not having enough storage. I tried wiping it clean and rebooting or reinstalling and all that stuff. And it just, it just still would not kind of keep up. And so uh, I, I went ahead and got the latest Apple Watch SE. And yeah, it's much faster. It's got 32 gigs of storage, so plenty of storage. I'm not going to have any storage issues. Uh, now, when it, now, on paper, it's not as good as the Series 8, or now they have the Apple Watch Ultra. But I, uh, I really honestly wouldn't notice the difference for what I use it for. I mean, I use it, my, my thing that I always tell people is the number one thing that I use the Apple Watch for is to, that's right, tell the time. And it does really good at that, but it is nice to also be able to glance and see the weather. And uh, I could start a podcast or some music right from my watch. And really with a Series 3, that was very difficult to do because it was so sluggish. Uh, I do like that it can track your activity and your workouts. It's a feature I've been using more in recent years. And so I really do like uh, the, the concept of the Apple Watch and what it does. I got the cellular version this time. I have not activated that yet, uh, but I am curious to maybe give that a try and just see how it works. And so uh, the greatest thing about the Apple Watch SE is that it starts at just 250 bucks. Um, and I, I really do believe this this this, uh, this watch, because that's the thing about Apple. I mean, Apple is, is the king of upselling. And so they would convince you that you need the Ultra, which is an $800 watch. Uh, or if nothing else, the SE, which uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's like four or 500 bucks. Um, but uh, the truth is, I think for four out of five people, the Apple Watch SE is going to be more than sufficient. So I highly recommend it if you are in the market. And again, for the price compared to other smartwatches, it is actually pretty solid. So uh, let's get to some questions and answers. Remember, you can text your questions to 615 900 4461. That's 615 900 4461. Text in your questions and we may just answer them on a future episode. And so we got this question here because we did an entire episode talking about the iPhone uh, 14, which again came out at the same time as this Apple Watch SE and the Apple Watch Series 8 and Ultra. But uh, they came out with the iTunes uh, with actually four, technically four new phones the iPhone 14, 14 Plus, 14 Pro. 14 Pro Max. And so this was an interesting question. Now we did, if you want to go back and watch that episode where we do a breakdown of which uh, we did, well, actually a couple episodes, we talked about everything Apple announced at the event. And then we did another episode where we actually talked about which iPhone you should buy. And we really just compared what, I, what Apple is currently offering. They're still offering the iPhone 12, the iPhone 13, and then all of the new iPhone 14 line. Well, this is an interesting question that we got uh, and uh, that I, I, I didn't consider, but it's, I'm actually very glad that this person asked it. So here's the question is, should I buy the iPhone 14 or the 13 Pro? So the 14 or the 13 Pro. Now, Apple, I will go ahead and say this, Apple has technically discontinued the 13 Pro. Yes, the 13 is still available, but the 13 Pro is not. And when you do a little bit of uh, digging and looking, you can see why. See, here's the thing. They are nearly identical 
with the exception of just a few features. So here's your biggest difference. On the 14, the biggest distinguisher from the 13 Pro is going to be the safety features. So it does have crash detection, emergency SOS, and, and the ability to connect by satellite uh, to a, directly to a satellite in case of emergency when you have no cell phone service. It also has things that they're calling like the photonic engine, which basically means that the colors on your photos are gonna be a bit more enhanced. Uh, however, th so that's what the 14 has that the 13 Pro does not. However, the 13 Pro has some things that the 14 doesn't have. It seems to have a slightly better screen. It's got the ProMotion technology. When you do a side-by-side -side comparison, it's the same, except for the 13 Pro has the ProMotion technology, which again, if you don't know what that is, it's probably not something the average person is going to notice. It just makes your, your screen really fluid as you, you know, uh, scroll through, uh, you know, things on your screen, watch videos and things like that. So it has that slightly better screen. It has better battery life. Uh, and uh, it also has that third uh, telephoto rear camera. So on the 14, just like the uh, 13 and the 12 and the 11, uh, the if it's not the Pro model, it only has two rear cameras. The, all, the Pro models have a third uh, telephoto uh, version of the camera. And so the 13 Pro has that, whereas the 14 does not. So in theory, uh, both the 14 and 13 Pro should actually land right now at the same price point. Because what they did is they brought in the 14 where the original 13 was, and now the 13, and I know this is confusing because there's so many iPhones nowadays. I remember when there was just one. I remember when there was the iPhone, and then a couple years later there was the iPhone 3G, and then there was the 3GS and the 4, and it was just one at, one at a time. But now, hey, Matt, we're not there anymore. Uh, but anyways, so this is this is might be difficult to track with, but um, so again, they took the 13 where the 13 uh, was, and they they knocked it off 100 bucks basically. And now the 14 is in the price point where the 13 was. Well, the 13 Pro was a hundred dollars more than the four than the. See, I'm confusing myself. Start over. The 13 Pro was, at, before the release of the 14 line, was about $100 more than the 13. So now that the 13 has officially been docked $100, uh, $100 that would mean that the 13 Pro's value is at the same value as the 14. And so uh, they uh, they are the same price as now. So the challenge though is going to be this. It's going to be finding that 13 Pro because again, Apple has discontinued it. In fact, I remember looking even in, uh, I couldn't find it anywhere. I looked on their website. I even looked in their refurbished site. Apple is now no longer directly selling the 13 Pro. So you'd probably, if you wanted to get it, You'd have to buy directly from a mobile, from your mobile character, so uh, carrier rather. So maybe a Verizon or AT and T is, is carrying it still. T Mobile, places like that. Uh, you might could find one on eBay or a used one from like a, an authorized reseller. So you might be able to get one, but I would imagine you'd have to act pretty fast to find these uh, because I'm sure Apple is no longer making these. Uh, see, with the 13, they're probably still actually uh, actually making a few new ones. With the 13 Pro, it's like hey, available as long as it's out there and once they're gone they're gone but if i could and i really had to choose between the two and i could find the 13 pro i'd actually go with that because i would rather have the uh, better battery uh, i'd rather have that third uh, camera uh and, and those two things in particular way uh, they, they just have a little bit more value to me than you know like i said the safety features and the photonic engine and so uh, again if you could find a 13 pro Maybe that's the one you should go with because again, on paper, it actually looks like it might be a slightly better option with the exception of those safety features on the 14. Well, here is our next question. Uh, and this is gonna be a pretty long one because it's kind of gonna uh, uh, transition us into our topic of the week. And that's this question. If you could pay for one streaming service, which one would it be? Well, I actually do only pay for one standalone streaming service. Uh, while in the past I've dabbled in all of them. And so here's what I thought I'd do. I'm gonna do a rundown of the different subscription or, or, or streaming subscriptions rather, and kind of talk through my experience with each one. So I've subscribed to Netflix in the past, uh, but Netflix content has really become more about quantity over quality. I remember when Netflix came out, it was the first place where you could really do true streaming. Uh, as far as streaming, you know, uh, professionally made content from, you know, Hollywood studios and things like that. Uh, so I remember it was like, oh, this is cool. You can subscribe to this and you can watch all these movies and Netflix had made all these deals. This is before all the big studios were trying to do streaming themselves. Uh, Netflix made all these deals with uh, these companies to say, hey, yeah, let us stream your content. We'll pay you to do that. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, they 
that's where it started out. Well, over the years now, the name of the game at Netflix has become original content. Uh, and when it comes to that original content, they have really just focused on quantity and really not on quality. Now look, some of their stuff is good. They have had some really good shows, but those are pretty rare. Most of the stuff on Netflix is just, it feels really, um, I don't know, it just feels kind of like filler. It's just not good. It's not good quality. It's uh, it's just not, I mean, uh, it's just not great. And so, um, most of it kind of sucks. And so I don't know, I'm, I'm no longer have any interest in Netflix at all. I think I'm logged into somebody's Netflix account. Cause that's how it works nowadays. You know, you just share one Netflix account with like 20 family members, but I can't remember if I'm actually still technically logged in or not because I never even bother with uh, going and, and using it. So, uh, so yeah, Netflix, meh. uh, when it comes to Hulu, um, they're kind of original draw. Cause it's like Netflix is original draw was, hey, look, this is the place where you can watch all the movies and, and stuff like that online. Now, that's pretty cool. Well, Hulu's original draw was that you could watch episodes that aired actually on television, like on broadcast and cable. You could watch it the next day. And there was a time where I cared about that, but I, I don't really find myself caring about that as much anymore. Now Hulu has taken the same model as Netflix and they moved into producing original stuff and they've had some decent original shows and, and stuff, but again, it's just not enough to draw me in. Well, then there's Paramount Plus, which I actually did subscribe to for a few months last year. And my main reason for doing that was because it allowed me to access a live stream. Uh, and anybody who subscribes, you can access a live stream of your, of, of basically the channel CBS. So your local CBS station, uh, which in my area was broadcasting a lot of SEC football. Um, but this season CBS isn't covering as many SEC games. So I've really not found a reason to uh, reactivate the subscription. Um, and so uh, beyond the live TV feature, the on-demand content of CBS and Paramount's catalog, I don't know, just wasn't compelling enough for me for me to stick with it. Now, then there's Peacock from Universal, and I have dabbled with that one as well, but, uh, and they actually offer a good bit of ad-supported shows and movies for free, so that is kind of nice. And of course, you can access, it's just some of it, you can access all of it, uh, including their originals, as well as some of their like high, like with The the Office, for example, is, is a huge, massive streaming hit. Uh, and it used to be on Netflix for the longest time, but once Peacock launched, they NBC took it back and they, now they stream it on Peacock. Uh, and I believe you can watch the first like three or four seasons on, uh, of the office for free. But after that, you've got to subscribe. They've also started releasing the super cut editions where they basically add the deleted scenes. That's all something that you'd have to subscribe to Peacock to get. Um, and so, uh, that kind of stuff. And then of course, being able to access, like I said, their original content they're that they're putting out on Peacock and being able to access stuff like Sunday night football, uh, like when, and, and some other, live events that they cover, uh, that does require their premium subscription, which I'm not currently paying for. Uh, because again, it's just not enough of a draw for me. Uh, and then there are some of the smaller, more more niche type of services like ESPN Plus, Discovery Plus, YouTube Premium. Um, I've dabbled again with kind of free trials and maybe some of that password sharing, uh, but I've never paid for any of these myself. And I, I don't, again, just doesn't appeal to me that much. So I don't really have that much of an opinion on it. Now, there are some other services that I guess I do technically pay for, but only because they are bundled with another service. Uh, that I'm already subscribed to. Uh, and I'm subscribed to that service, not for the streaming, but for other features. Um, so it, the question is, is okay, if I had to pay for the streaming platform alone, uh, independently, would I do it? Well, let's talk through that. So HBO Max uh, is, is the best example here. Uh, I get this bundled with my internet package because AT&T is my uh, internet provider. Uh, now HBO Max has a lot of content from Warner Brothers and of course HBO. And I know not everything on HBO is completely vile and disgusting, but it's it's original content. It just doesn't have a good reputation. And so I really have no interest in HBO's shows. Like I've never gotten into, I can't think of one I've ever really gotten into uh, or, or even, you know, watched like Game of Thrones, never got into it, Westworld, never cared. Uh, and again, because those shows right there carry a lot of uh, reputation for kind of what they're known for in terms of, and it's not necessarily their compelling storylines. Uh, and so um, with HBO Max, I've watched a couple movies 
Uh, but I can't remember the last time I opened the app. Every once in a while, I'll be like, well, what's on here? Okay, yep, yeah, bye. Uh, but so I, I for sure would not be paying on this uh, or paying for it as, as a standalone thing if it wasn't already just bundled into what I have. Um, and not to mention their parent company, Warner Brothers, has recently merged with Discovery. Uh, and so there's actually been, there's a lot of shakeups that have been going on there. And uh, we're actually going to uh, discuss how that's going to affect HBO Max here in a bit. Uh, so yeah, HBO Max, yeah, not great. Would not pay for it standalone. Now, also, I do technically pay for Prime Video, but that comes with my Prime membership, which I uh, I have that be simply for the online ship or the quick shipping and online shopping with Amazon. I mean, I I've never uh, never once thought, oh, I got to keep my Prime Video subscription, so I got to make sure I renew my membership. Um, now, look, I know that there's some good content on Prime, and I've watched a couple things there that are that are pretty interesting, um, but I rarely do watch it. Um, and, uh, and, and I have lately been tuning in to Thursday night football. Uh, it's just kind of something I put on while I fall asleep on Thursday nights in, in the fall. Um, and now that is, which is pretty interesting. It's now exclusively streaming on Amazon prime video. Uh, so if you want to count that, sure, but I don't know what I pay for prime video on its own. Uh, I, I'm really not sure about that. I would lean towards probably not. And the last thing that I pay for through a bundle is Apple TV Plus. But again, this is the same as Prime and then it's bundled in with the Apple One subscription. And I have that subscription mainly for the iCloud storage and Apple Music. Um, and, and so the Apple TV Plus is just thrown in there. Uh, now, here's what I do appreciate about Apple TV Plus. You know, Netflix, it's all about quantity over quality. Well, Apple is exactly the opposite. I mean, they really kind of, the Apple culture of like doing a few things and doing them well really kind of flows into their content. Um, it's growing, but they're really focused on the quality of their content. They want to have the best uh, actors, the best uh, creators and producers and filmmakers. Um, and I mean, when they first launched, they had really just a handful of of shows. And so, um, that is the, uh, really thing about Apple again is the, the, st the, the content is quality. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't know if I would really feel like I had to pay for it or wanted to pay for it or wanted to keep access to it if it wasn't already bundled into that, that Apple one subscription. Um, and so, I mean, I think, all, I think the most I would do is if there was a good show that came out, uh, I would just activate it for like a month, watch the show and deactivate it. Um, I've done that with Netflix before. Uh, and I feel like that's what I would do. I don't know if I would remain an active subscriber beyond that. So this is a very long runway uh, to get to my answer of what is the one streaming platform I would pay for and currently do pay for uh, as far as a standalone streaming platform. There's a part of me that hates to admit it, but this service is, as you may have already uh, concluded, it is Disney Plus. Uh, and I do pay for it. Uh, like I said, I'm just, it's not part of a bundle or anything. I'm just paying for it as is and intend to continue to pay for it. And it's frequently utilized primarily by my daughter because she likes watching her, you know, kids shows and stuff on there. Now there are some original shows that would be more appealing to me, uh, shows from Marvel, from Lucasfilm and Star Wars. And I have watched a few of them. And, and while I've enjoyed some of them, like the Mandalorian is, is, is pretty good, pretty solid. Loki, uh, was an incredible Marvel series. Uh, and, and a couple of the other ones are, are, are okay as well, but I'm convinced, uh, that most of the, the shows are not the best shows ever. And as time goes on, just like I've said about Marvel before uh, and, and Star Wars, like they're just getting worse. Um, like, yeah, some of the latest stuff from Marvel, I just, I can't do it. Like She-Hulk couldn't do it. Tried, gave it like two or three episodes. And I don't know. I don't know if I'll finish the series. Uh, it just is so, it's 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 nothing to do with with anything except for just, it's just not that compelling of a story, to be honest with you. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I mean, again, like I, I, I've, at, at this time, I don't really know what to report on Andor, one of the latest series from the Star Wars universe there on Disney+. Plus. I will tell you the first episode I wasn't super impressed with. Um, and so anyways, it, it's just, uh, again, it's this idea of this stuff, this, this content 
it's just not that great. But um, the thing is, is for me, it's more about my daughter uh, having something that she can watch. And yes, Disney for sure has their issues and their agenda. But when it comes to Disney Plus, uh, you also get access to almost every movie that they've ever made, including a lot of the classics. Uh, so basically anything that growing up was in our, our closet full of VHS tapes and DVDs at my house, uh, that can now be accessed anywhere and anytime. And so I can kind of relive some of these classics with my daughter. Uh, for example, we've gone back and we've rewatched the good Pixar movies of the kind of the early days of the 2000s uh, there with like Toy Story, the Toy Story movies, which are all excellent. Uh, Finding Nemo, Monsters, Inc. Uh, and we've really enjoyed watching these together. I mean, Pixar as of late has not been doing great stuff, but they do have a catalog of, of nearly 20 years of really excellent movies. Uh, and so now I know what you might be thinking. Well, Disney, yeah, they've kind of, uh, they've kind of, uh, gone, gone super, super far to the one side here in terms of their ideology and, and what they're trying to promote with their agendas. And, and so what are we doing about, you know, am I just letting my kid go and watch stuff mindlessly? Absolutely not. Uh, I am doing my best to guard what she watches, um, and making sure, you know, Disney's not trying to sneak something in. Uh, so the thing is she never watches TV alone, uh, or if I'm within ear or I have to at least kind of be within earshot. Um, and she also has just a pre-approved list of shows that she can watch, uh, when I'm not actively watching with her. Uh, and so she knows that, uh, you know, it's like Bluey. Yep. Bluey's fine. Puppy pals. Uh, I don't know. A couple other things. Can't think off the top of my head what they are. And so, uh, that's just kind of how I've had to manage it. Uh, but, but she's never watching alone. I'm always around. Uh, and so, you know, I feel pretty good about that. So Disney plus, yeah, it's presently the only standalone streaming service I pay for. Uh, to be honest, I'm actually glad that I don't pay for a bunch of other content platforms to distract me. Uh, I enjoy a good TV show. Uh, there is a connection that you can make with characters and stories that can be only, that really only can be done through a series of, you know, with, ex with ongoing episodes and, and that, that maybe can't be as effectively developed in a two hour movie. With that said, I am just of the opinion I'd rather watch good movies, uh, because there is something, uh, to be said about telling your story in a single long form piece of content. Uh, what that does is that forces a good filmmaker to be precise and intentional in every element of what makes the cut in their final product. It, re it leaves uh, little room for filler content, uh, unfulfilled or empty plot points, uh, and wasted screen time, which is really what very often happens uh, uh, in uh, shows and series. Uh, the, I don't know how many times have you watched a show and they introduce this this potential new storyline and they go nowhere with it. They, they, they ask questions that never get answered or they have a character that's just kind of a complete waste that is there and serves no purpose. You don't, if you're, if you're good, if you're, if you're trying to tell a good story with a movie, you don't get that. So that might be something to think about as you decide what streaming services you are going to use and what content you are going to stream, which brings me to kind of uh, a final thought here. Uh, and really I, it's an article that I read. Um, I mean, look, as far as streaming goes, yeah, it's the future. It's here to stay. But according to an article I found uh, on uh, by way of Not The Bee, uh, which is a spinoff of the Babylon Bee, uh, and they were just linking over in an article here from uh, CNN Business, the streaming wars uh, seem to be coming to an end. And so if you want to read this article, I'm actually going to include the link in the show notes or the description here uh, of the episode. Uh, but I wanted to kind of walk you through some of the high, uh, the high points. This is very interesting. This article is by uh, Frank Pelota from CNN Business. And it says that the war to win uh, over streaming subscribers uh, at any cost is over. Uh, so this is how the streaming war started. Really, it was just Netflix. Then Disney Plus came along and Disney Plus in 2019 kind of became the main, there were other things there. Prime Video was already there. Obviously Hulu was already there, but Disney really came along because they're such a big name. They have so much content and the resources and means to produce new content. So they really kind of uh, ignited that, that streaming war. Uh, and the name of the game up to this point has been do whatever it takes to get subscribers. And what that means is that a lot of these platforms have just, that's why it seemed like, oh, eight bucks a month, I can watch all the content I want. That's why it's so cheap and it seems to be so affordable. But things are changing. Disney 
is hiking its prices after losing a ton of money, this from the article, on its various streaming services. Netflix recently jacked up prices and is cracking down on password sharing. Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, this is uh, CNN's parent company, it's scrapping films and series left and right and revising its controversial everything under one streaming roof strategy. All three services are expanding their ad-supported offerings. Uh, the, the article continues, streaming itself isn't going anywhere. It's the present and it is the future of Hollywood. But the spend now, ask questions later days look to be coming to an end as these services mature and media companies cleave to what makes money. The streaming wars are over because subscriber growth has come to a halt. This is from Michael Nathanson, a media analyst at Moffat Nathanson. Uh, and he says, you're fighting a war in a land that has no more resources in it. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery has canceled multiple big budget projects for HBO Max while also reiterating that it's not trying to win the streaming spending war. Next, Netflix growth uh, has stalled after it's lost subscribers two quarters in a row. So Netflix was growing and growing and growing. In the past two quarters, they have, for the first time, really, I think, since their streaming existed, uh, have actually lost subscribers. Uh, its stock has fallen roughly 60% so far this year, and in a bid to course correct, the platform is transforming itself from a streaming revolutionary to a new age legacy media company. Next year, it's debuting a lower priced, ad-supported option, something it said it would never do, and it's clamping down on that password sharing, something it previously said it helped that had helped it grow. So, so we're seeing these massive changes here happening amongst these big streaming providers. Uh, the article continues, streaming is evolving, but if the streaming wars phase is coming to an end, then what's next? Well, the next phase of the streaming revolution is believed to be one of consolidation and bundling. Uh, so uh, let's think about uh, when Disney Plus was launched, uh, Disney Plus is the parent company of a lot of things. And so it was able to offer a bundle where you could get uh, Disney Plus, of course, and it still offers this bundle, Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. And so this is assumed to be the future of streaming is what these big companies, what can they do to justify or to, to get the consumer to justify the uh, increased price by bundling even more in it. In fact, I read in another article, can't remember the exact source, that Disney is actually also considering working with some theater chains to include uh, movie passes to go to the theater, basically, as part of their Disney Plus subscription. So that is becoming the name of the game. Warner Brothers Discovery, again, these two companies uh, have recently merged. They've announced that they will be merging their two streaming platforms. So HBO Max and Discovery Plus, they are going to merge into something new or one's going to absorb the other. And that's all going to be debuting next summer. So with streaming transforming into something new, uh, consumers are in a shock to the system. Uh, this quote coming from the article, Wall Street just paid people for subscribers. And because it paid people for subscribers, companies didn't care about the economics. Uh, they were willing to do whatever they could do to chase subscribers. Streaming is here to stay. It's the focus of Hollywood and how millions watch TV shows and films. That's not changing, even if the dynamics and strategies of the business behind them are. And here, here is a very telling thing about our, our, our society uh, now. Uh, video remains the most popular leisure activity in the world. Uh, but streaming may change. But consumers will adapt. They love video too much. So basically, here's what's happening. We got in this these big companies and studios, they have taken a loss in order to gain market share. Uh, they've reshaped the entertainment industry, and ultimately, they really kind of created an all-new product line for consumers because, I mean, before 10, 15 years ago, the idea of streaming your content was unheard of. Internet wasn't ready for it. It wasn't fast enough. Our devices weren't fast enough and capable enough. Well, now that's all changed, and we have an all-new product here of streaming. Uh, and it seems to be a must have, I say must have for uh, most first world people, uh, because it's the most convenient way to access entertainment content. So these streaming platforms, they got us hooked. And now we're going to have to pay any price to keep it. 
So the uh, sub $10 a month subscription era, that's quickly coming to a close. Uh, if you're willing to deal with ads, you might be able to keep uh, access to prices maybe in that price range, but I wouldn't be surprised if the average cost for most major streaming services is in the $20 a month range in the next year or two. I mean, the Netflix, when you look at Netflix pricing options, their top tier is already there and they have made it very clear that their pricing only will continue to increase. So this is just a good reminder that there's more to life than watching TV. And I enjoy it. You know, hey, we do a whole podcast here talking about all types of things in media and tech and, and entertainment and so forth. Uh, so I obviously enjoy it. But hey, there are other ways to enjoy yourself and the others around you. So as the price for streaming goes up, most people, honestly, they're just going to pay it. Uh, because these companies, they're just going to send you a nice little courtesy email that says, hey, effective this date, we're going to start charging you this much. And they're going to incrementally do that probably once or twice a year. Uh, they've already, again, been doing it. And most people, they're just going to pay it, you know. Uh, but what I'd like to think is that some of us uh, will actually take a step back. And maybe we'll eliminate a few of those streaming subscriptions from our monthly expenses. Not just to put some money back into our budget, but to put more time back into more meaningful aspects of our lives. Hey, remember to text your questions to 615-900-4461. That's 615-900-4461. Saying it nice and slow for those of you listening on double speed. And hey, make sure you subscribe on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to podcasts. Hey, I do hope you will, if you enjoy this content, share it with your friends. If you're a pastor or a church leader listening, hey, share this maybe with your church because we're trying to help all people and your people there at your church. And again, all people in general, we're trying to help you navigate this crazy media-driven culture. Media is defining our culture. And whether you want to see that as a good thing or a bad thing, it's happening. And what we not, what we don't need to do is to sit by and just do everything again to preach against it happening. Well, th that's not going to really get us too far. What we need to do is we need to be have a part in cultivating conscious consumers that can also become creative contributors. So I would appreciate it if you'd share this content again with someone that you think might benefit from it. If you want to connect with us, you can connect with us online at mustincrease.com. I want to thank you for joining me for this episode. And I look forward to seeing you again in the next as we continue to increase truth and inspire hope in the lives of others right here on the Must Increase podcast.